morning guys when i look at my life and when i think and feel how i am right now the path of mind wealth that i'm on just how happy how free how peaceful i feel right now i want everybody in the world to feel the happiness i feel right now within me but i always think how on earth is it possible that i got to this point when i look at the challenges and struggles i faced in my life and i know they're nothing compared to some of the ones you might be going through or other people have gone through. But the key is this, embrace the struggle. That's the key. Whatever challenge you're going through, whatever stress, whatever anxiety, understand that there's a reason it's going after you. Don't fight it. Let it come in. Don't be destroyed by it. Fight it, but know that it's there, but seeking you because you are a miracle. You are one in 400 trillion. It wants you because it's gonna help improve you. Have a great day, everybody. and shine it's in special time hey it's evan carmichael and successful people don't wake up and go yes what another day to be alive but when you have a morning routine that sets you up for success like watching one of these videos it will change your life so let's start your day off right together grab your coffee know that i believe in you and get ready for a shot of espresso from kevin o'leary <laughs> i wake up every morning so keep me going. Keep me going. I wake up every morning. I've come to a new place in my understanding what works and doesn't. I also went through the educational process. I did an MBA and people ask me, does that have anything to do with success or failure? And I say, no, it doesn't. I don't remember a single thing I learned there for the two years except the people I met that, that now are out there in the world as bankers and lawyers and whatever else they are. And I use them as my bit database of contacts to help build my businesses. So I think that was important, but the classes, I forget completely what it was about. I will say one thing though, I've learned something from what the Europeans do, Evan, and listen to this. In Switzerland, I have a stepfather who's Swiss, he lives in Geneva, Switzerland. I've been going over there for 40 years, back and forth. Take a company like Nestle. They offer an internship program that they call an apprentice program over there. It's, it's almost like the sorcerer's helper in a Disney movie. In high school, if you think you like the food industry, maybe, you know, Nestle's a global food company, they'll let you come in and work on weekends and afternoons after school to see what it's like in the real world. Even though you're just a teenager, why are they doing that? They're trying to figure out who is going to be the next asset for their company that is going to be someone who attaches themselves to the business maybe long term. So they get to try you out, you get to try them out, they pay you a small stipend, but that's an apprenticeship. What an opportunity for you. You're a teen. You're sitting in a meeting with a bunch of managers, you're, you're absorbing all that stuff and you're learning. Why the hell don't we do that in North America? Because maybe one out of 10 is the right person, but once you're indoctrinated, if that's the right word, into the, call it the Nestle program, you're a Nestleite. You're there. They want you, you want them, and away your career goes. I love it. I think every company in North America should take that program on and, and offer this opportunity to kids in their teens and say, look, you wanna see what work is? You wanna see what it's like? Get in here. But it also gives you a chance as an entrepreneur to say, I understand the corporate structure and now I want to try something a little different on my own, but I will have had that base of information, not only about what it's like, but that sector. If you love the food industry, you're with the El Supremo and you're learning about it. And then one day you can split off and say, hey, Nestle, I'm going to build this food business. You want to buy it from me after it gets to 50 million? That's the program I like. You don't know until you try. How do you know if you're going to be great at something? How do you know if you're going to love something? How do you know if this, if this next thing is a thing for you or not? How do you know? You don't. You don't know until you go off and say yes and you try. And we're, we're constantly stuck in judgment mode saying, oh, that'll never work. That'll never work for me. I, I, I won't enjoy that. Until you actually do it, you're not going to get the feedback to know if it's worth doing or not. I think this is why most people in the world, you know, I'm looking out on the highway here in front of me. Most people in the world right now are driving to work that they hate. They're driving to work 
that you hate, a life that you hate, a life that has no meaning, no purpose, no fulfillment, mailing in the day every day, just doing the bare minimum to not get fired. This is most people. Most people are not happy with their life. Most people know that they want to do more, that they're capable of more, and they're not happy. They're, they're stuck. But a big reason why you're stuck is you're not saying yes to enough things, at least to try. I'm not saying go and mortgage the house and do some crazy thing, but say yes to the little things because you never know which one's going to pay off. Any new experiment, as long as it's not putting you know somebody at, at harm or at risk and it's not against your ethical values, it's worth saying yes to to try. Say yes to salsa dancing, say yes to yoga, say yes to making a YouTube video, say yes to creating some content, say yes to making that phone call, say yes to asking that person out, say, just say yes. Stay, we are in the no business. Just say yes, because all of your next great ventures are on the other side of you saying yes, even though 80% of them aren't gonna work out, that's normal. That's fine, that's part of life. I look at my store as an example. So I have been on YouTube for 12 years. April 2009 was my, was my first video. And on paper, it doesn't make any sense. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm shy, I'm introverted. I have no need to be famous. I don't like the spotlight. Um, as long as I have my wife, I'm good. Like I don't need, I don't need to hang out with people. Um, so you look at that person, like, but that on paper, if you fill out any of the, any of the career assessments of what are you supposed to do with your life, making YouTube videos, <laughs> being in front of the camera is not anywhere close to what uh, someone like me should be doing, right? There's no way. But I just tried making a video and even though I wasn't very good at it, I liked it. It's like, for some reason, I like this. I don't know, there's no reason why I should like it. You know, I don't like being famous, I don't like the spotlight, I'm nervous getting in front of the camera, but for whatever reason, I like it. So I need to keep doing it. Right, it took me 350 videos before I was completely not embarrassed by myself, and 700 until I actually liked what I was making. It's a lot of videos. Why, why do you, why do you, how do you keep going? Well, because I liked it. You know, how have I not had burnout? 10,000 plus videos later, because I, I like it. This doesn't feel like work. When I when I sit down and make content, it doesn't, I don't look at that in my calendar and say, oh, I gotta make more videos. Oh, I hate my life, right? Like if it got to there, I wouldn't make videos anymore. I like it. You don't burn out from doing the things that you actually enjoy. And so even though on paper, it makes no sense for me to be here, here I am, because I just said yes and tried it. And if you ask me when I first got started, will you have 3 million subscribers? It's like, there's no way, are you kidding me? You know, I'll be like, if I get a thousand subscribers, who's gonna wanna follow me? And here we are. Similarly, I uh, took up salsa dancing. And again, on paper, it makes no sense. I didn't learn salsa dancing growing up. Um, there's no you know, background in my family of music. I felt like I had two left feet. I'm relatively tall, you know, 6'1", so I take big steps. It's, it's harder for me to, to pick up the moves and to dance with somebody because my steps are just naturally bigger than other people. Uh, I don't speak Spanish for the language. So it's like all of these things that are legit reasons, right? These are all things that are legitimate reasons that could hold you back. But I thought, you know what? I'm gonna go to, I'll go to one class. Who cares? Like who cares if you go to one class or something and suck at it, right? What's the big deal? We spend so much time criticizing, judging other things instead of just going and trying and saying yes and see what happens. I went into a salsa class and I was not very good at it. And I did not understand the music. And when the instructor said, just do this with your hips, like, I, but I don't know how to just do that with my hips. <laughs> I spent so much time trying to get my feet right and I couldn't figure out how to get my feet and my hands working together at the same time. I, I wasn't very good at the beginning, just like what it would have said on paper, right? If you, if you looked at who I was on paper, it's like, there's no way this guy's gonna be good at it. And hey, the paper was right, but I liked it. I don't know, there's just about walking to that class and dancing to the music. It just felt, it felt, it felt good. And I wanted to go back and do it again. Fast forward to today and I own the largest salsa dancing company, maybe in North America. You know, I've, I've been paid to do salsa 
dancing. I've been a paid professional performer. I've been, I've been paid to do choreography. I've been paid to teach classes. I've been, you know, now I run the company. It's crazy, right? For the guy on paper who's got two left feet, too, too tall, takes huge steps, didn't learn it growing up, doesn't speak Spanish, doesn't play any of the instruments, here I am. And it's not that I'm anything special, it's totally available to you too. It's just a matter of saying yes to things. So step one is, is just say yes more. You know, a lot of the things, as long as it's not against your, your ethics, right? Like don't go rob a store because you're saying yes, right? You know, as long as you're not hurting somebody else and it's within your moral compass, then say yes and try instead of judging. Just, just give it an opportunity because you never know what great things are going to come as a result of it. The greatest things in my life were, didn't make sense on paper, but I just liked it and I said yes to it, right? And fully expect, you know, too, fully expect most things not to work out. It's okay. It's okay if it doesn't work out. Guys, it's okay if it's a failed experiment. It's okay. If you're only taking shots, at the things that you have a high degree of certainty that are gonna work out, you, you're gonna play small for your entire life. It's okay if it doesn't work out. Again, as long as you're not hurting somebody or hurting yourself or against your ethics, it's okay if it doesn't work out. It's okay if you suck at salsa dancing and you never wanna go do it again. It's okay if you suck at making YouTube videos and you never wanna do it again. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. You didn't hurt anybody. You said yes. And you're building that belief system that you'll say yes to the next thing and eventually find the thing that you want to be great at, your next great adventure, right? So it's okay if it doesn't work out. And then number three is just pay attention to the feeling. More important than whether you are good or not at it is did you like it? Because if you're good at something but you don't like it, you're never gonna win, right? This is a trap that a lot of people fall into. Like you're really good at something, you're good at it, but you don't like it. And so you can make some money doing it and have some impact doing it because you're, you're good at it for whatever reason. But if it doesn't make you come alive, you're just never gonna win the whole thing. You're never gonna have as big an impact as you can. You're gonna forever feel trapped by the situation you're in because you don't enjoy it. The number one rule for success is you have to love what you do, whether it's artists or entrepreneurs or inventors or athletes, like all the people that I profiled, the number one rule for success that comes up most consistently over and over and over and over and over and over again is you gotta love what you do. You, you need to love what you do. <laughs> the problem is at the beginning, a lot of times you're not good at the thing that you love, you know? So when you're not good at it, what do you do? You keep going. Because just like anything else, if it's a skill set, you can learn any skill set. I learned how to get better on camera. It took me a long time compared to most people. You could probably get there faster than me. You probably have a lot more natural tendencies for it, but I've gotten better because I just kept doing it. Kept making videos. It's been over 10,000 videos over 12 years, so almost 1,000 videos a year. Well, you better get good at something if you're doing it 1,000 times a year. Okay. So I've gotten better at it. Same thing with salsa dancing. I was not very good at it. And then I practiced and I kept going, but the practice didn't feel like work. That's the thing. Practicing my videos doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like, oh, I gotta go do that thing. Like, oh man, I gotta go dancing. I remember when I came out of my dance class, I would, I would be trying to memorize the moves. I would be, I'd still have the music in my head. Like I'm not wearing earphones. I just had the music in my head and I'd be waiting for the bus or streetcar or subway or um, in a line and I would be practicing my moves be practicing them. I, I remember I had one meeting with a guy, <laughs> it's a little embarrassing. I had one meeting with a guy um, uh, to talk about my mastermind group for entrepreneurship and we met at a coffee shop and I was asking about his business. And as a leader in dancing, you have to come up with combinations, right? So the leaders come up with the combinations and then they have to lead the followers to follow the combination. And so I was trying to come up with a new combination for what I could do when I was dancing. And while I was talking to this guy, I remember zoning out while he was telling his story. And, and I was thinking, okay, if I, if I took his hand and, and I put it this way, and then with this hand, could I, could, I, could I spin the person around? And can we come back? I'm coming up with dance choreography while I'm with him. That's a sign that you're on the right path. 
right? Like that's a sign that you're doing the right thing. And usually we try to shut out those distractions. No, no, like lean into them, lean towards them because there's something great inside of that. Even if it doesn't make any sense, right? And so I practiced, I was thinking about it naturally and, and all the time. And so that's a sign I have to go and do the thing. It's the same thing for you. The things that you daydream about, the things that for you don't feel like work, but for other people, it's crazy amounts of work. The thing that you just can get lost in and spend hours doing and time seems to fly. Like inside of that is your next great opportunity, even if you're not good at it yet. So we start to say yes. Say yes more. Just say yes. It's also within your code of ethics, right? You're not hurting anybody. You say yes. Try it. Stop judging it. Just try it. Two, don't expect to be good at it. Don't expect to be good at it at all. Expect to suck. It's your first time doing it, right? So expect it not to be great. But three, pay attention to the feeling. How did it make you feel? Did you like it? You want to go back and do it again? Because that's a yes. You could be on track to find your next great love, your next great business venture, your next great life adventure, your next great life. Your great life is on the other side of those three things. When we can stop judging, critiquing, overthinking, overanalyzing, and just say yes, to pay attention to the feeling it gives you, your whole life changes. Being in business is like being a gladiator. Think about it. What sport? Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're going to enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I want to know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. When you watch a video and just get motivated, the science says you have a 35% chance of actually following through on your goals. That, that's not good enough. No, not for you, Believe Nation. we got to do something. But when you write it down and you create a specific plan of action for the next week, that number jumps to 91% chance of you following through. And when you commit to somebody else, like leaving a comment on this video, it jumps to 95%. You need to follow through on your goals. So what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your specific plan of action for the next week? Put it down in the comments below so I can celebrate you.
Soy puertorriqueño como Dari ninguno. Dama azúcar no se llama la fe. Pa' que se mezclen a mi piel café. Padre negro, madre blanca, los colores más bacanos. Eh. Por eso es que veo a todo el mundo como un hermano. Yeah. that same power, that same determination to see in our minds the image, the visions that we want to create today in our lives. Let's see ourselves doing the best we can on all of the stretches and exercises we do together here. that power we have, our true being, our presence, our determination to see in our mind right now, go into the future. Good morning, Determination. How's everyone doing today? Another beautiful day here, outdoors. Uh, if you're indoors, wherever you are, let's go, everybody. Here we go. Another wonderful moment together. Another great day in the gym of life. Gym of life never ends. So here we go. We're going to start, when I say go, we're going to start jogging on the spot, doing the best jog we can, best jog we've ever done, or we can simply walk on the spot. So depending on how much space you have. We should be able to do this within the space that we have. So here we go. Ready, everybody? When I say go, your best jog ever. Ready? And go. Still focused on our breathing. In through your nose. 
out. Feeling the joy of you commanding your body. Remember, you're the boss of your mind. Your mind is the boss of your body. Almost there. Let's go, everybody. Keep going. Feel the power of our heart starting to beat a little bit faster. Our breathing becoming a little bit more difficult. But feel our power still controlling our breathing. And stop. All right, back to our best walk, either side to side or simply walking on the spine. But focused on our breathing, in through your nose and out through your mouth. Oh, wow. What a day. What another pristine, perfect day. Enjoy every moment, wherever you are. Enjoy this. Enjoy your power, your gift. And always work on your mind and your body. Always in the gym of life. Okay, everybody, let's start with our 10 shoulder rolls forward. Here we go. Ready? And go. So the joy of you rolling your shoulders forward. Being able to do that. Stop. Let's do arm circles forward. Big arm circles. Ten forward. Now let's go backwards. Again, just feel the joy of you controlling your body to move through space. All through the power and control of your own determination. for the sky wherever you are. Here we go. Holding it for 10 seconds. And now reach for your toes, straight knees. Again, feel the joy and the striving. Reaching for your toes, even if you can't touch them yet. Always yet. back up. Okay, let's uh, work on our balance. Grab one leg and find your balance. Bend the other knee if you have to. Hold it for 10. Pull that leg back. Pull the power of you. Finding your balance in this moment. And switch to the leg. And bend that knee. Then you've got roots going under your feet, going through the ground. Excellent. All right. And let's hug our knee this time. Bend the other knee if you have to. Big hug. And find that balance again. Hold it for 10 seconds. Get your balance. You get it right back. Switch to the side. That balance, and again, bring that leg up all the way up. All right, 
Excellent, everyone. Let's do five push-ups together. Here we go. That's five push-ups. If you got to keep your knees down, go ahead. Whatever you do, do your best. Five sit-ups. What a moment. All right, and let's do five squats. Our best five squats. Here we go. Feet flat on the floor, looking straight ahead. Bending the knees all the way down, all the way up. All right, let's do lunges now. Three on each side. Let's lunges. Turn that back straight if we can, looking straight ahead. Excellent. All right, let's do 10 second plank. Bell these knees off the ground. Always thinking of whatever. Bringing ourselves back to our present time. for our toes, everybody. Here we go. Ready? Straight knees or reaching for your toes. Do the best we can. Always working on motivating our mind. We know our bodies will follow. And be shape with our legs. Reaching for the floor as far away from our body as we can. Holding it there. For one side, hold it there. Yeah, feel the joy. Reach and strive. Do your best. Even if you aren't able to reach where you want to be yet. And switch to the other side. Feel the power of your wing right now. Alright, and let's put our feet together. And gently push our knees down with our elbows. There we go. Hold it there for 10. Feel the power of infinite intelligence in you, and me, and all of us right now. Okay, one leg forward, one leg back. Go as far back as you can. Keep that knee on the ground. down. Make sure you're not hurting yourself. You should just feel a pull, not anything. Okay, and switch to the other side. Alright, and let's roll onto our belly and push the ground or the floor and look up at the ceiling or the sky, wherever we are. Here we go. Cobra stretch. Hold it there for 10. Feel the power of your being right here, right now. Okay, and legs crossed again. Back straight. Eyes closed. Breathing in through our noses and out through our mouth. Going into the future, into our imagination right now. Seeing what we want to do our best on today when that music goes on. For me, I'm going to be working on two exercises. One is lunges, as many lunges as I can do within the first song. Second song, as many sit-ups as I can do until that song is over. So what about you? See it in your mind right now. You can play two of your own songs. You can listen to the songs I have. But choose your own exercises if you don't like the ones I'm doing. It doesn't matter. Whatever you're doing, whatever you want to do, whatever movement you want to do safely and effectively, see it in your mind right now before you bring it out into the world.
do we do our best on these exercises when that music goes on? It's an expression, a reflection of the way we do our best at everything. Jim. Proud of you. If you haven't given up, keep going. Alright, sit up for me. Here we go. Always control your breathing. Bring you back to that. The fact that you can still control your breathing, even when your body wants to breathe faster, that's more proof of your determination. You do that in you all the time, no matter what. 
you can apply this. You can use this energy. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are. The way you talk. The way you behave. The way you read, write. The way you're kind and loving. Use determination. Use your power to be positive and never give up. Just like we're doing right now. On these exercises, on these sit-ups, we're not giving up. No matter how hard it's getting. See, we know the truth. If we do what is easy, we give up. Our life will be hard. But if we do what is hard, we never give up. Our life will be easy. So we gotta remember that all the time. That's the power of our determination. Controlling our mind. Motivating the mind. So the body will fall. Keep going, determination. So proud of you wherever you are. Because you are who you are. Strive to be better all the time. You are infinite and talented. You, we, are double I. Infinitely intelligent, powerful beyond measure. We don't choose to lose, we determine and win. Still with me? Keep going. I love you. So proud of you. Keep going. Even if you stop. Get back up. How did it get? Keep going. This is the way you're going to live. Even if you stop, even if you get tired, even if you make mistakes, you're going to learn. You're going to get information. And you're going to eventually win. That's how powerful you are. That's why I love you and all. Song, that's okay, that's good. Love it, keep going. Our body will rest and recover. Almost there. Keep going, everybody, keep going. Oh, well done. So proud of you. our body try to take control of our minds feel that that's you the real you that's our consciousness our being awake fully 
to control our minds, to control our breathing, to control our bodies, to control our lives. It's all possible through the power of you being present, staying in the now, right here, right now, wherever you are, wherever you are. There is no past and future right now. this peace right here in this moment right now, we can always have all the mind health, even greater all the mind wealth we were built for. I love your determination. Great work today. I'm so proud of you. Wherever you are, take the power of this time we had together, apply it to everything in your life. doesn't matter whether we're in school, at work, wherever we are. The gym of life never ends. And life is the greatest teacher. That's why I love you and everything and all the infinite intelligence around us. It's life. It's always here. You're always learning, always growing. I love your determination. Have a great day, week, and life always. Until next time. degenerative diseases, whether it's ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, are characterized by the production of, of proteins that are misfolded. Uh, so think of these proteins as basketballs uh, that need to be inflated a certain uh, volume so you can dribble correctly, right? Once, once that, that basketball becomes deflated uh, as a protein, we call these misfolded proteins. So there really, there really are two challenges uh, in our approaches to ALS and other conditions. One is to uh, figure out how to block the production of these proteins, because these proteins will continuously be misfolded uh, based upon genetic abnormalities that a person uh, has acquired as a result of these conditions. And the second challenge is once those misfolded proteins are actually uh, uh, created, how do you degrade them? Because at the, these proteins are pathological and they build up like atherosclerosis. In fact, we now there's, there's plenty of evidence right now uh, that these conditions, uh, you know, ALS, Parkinson's, uh, and Alzheimer's disease uh, have these plaques uh, in the vascular system. There's a condition called amyloid angiopathy, which, which speaks to that. So in other words, I, the, way I, the way I've been thinking about uh, neurology right now is the way that I think cardiologists began thinking about heart disease uh, back in the 70s, meaning that, that you know, unless you're at the stage where you need sur surgery, right, to remove whatever plaques are building up, the best bet is identifying who has these conditions, number one, uh, and number two, uh, putting a full-scale preventative program uh, with the same risk factor management as we do for cardiovascular disease, because like you said, you know, the, the pathology manifests based upon where a person's most vulnerable. So people with genetic risk for Alzheimer's, that's where this pathology is gonna show up. But the pathology itself is very similar. I mean, you know, misfolded proteins are basically what clots are, right? Clots are basically protein aggregates that are misfolded and therefore can't be removed by the body's immune system. So uh, what, I, what I mean to say is that I think that, you know, our, our goals here are to, to manage these 
as chronic diseases. I, I tell people, my goal as a clinician is to help you live with ALS, not die from the condition. That's, that's what I you know, try to encourage people to think about. Do you think that all of these chronic diseases, whether it's cancer, whether it's heart disease, Alzheimer's, ALS, do you think that they all have, um, what I was gonna ask is, do you think they have the same set, is probably the right word, of underlying conditions? Or do you think it's just that the body only has so many uh, make or break mechanics and things impact those make or break mechanics in different ways? That's, that's a fantastic question, by the way. Fantastic question. So I think that we need to understand sort of uh, a little bit more in depth about how the body normally handles these proteins, because there are uh, cellular mechanisms uh, within our cells that are endogenous mechanisms that help us break down these proteins. Uh, it's an area of the cell called the lysosome, uh, which is a very acidic environment that takes a degraded protein uh, and literally breaks it down so that it's no longer pathological. Basically, you know, the, the body has to find a housekeeping effect to essentially dissolve these pathological proteins. So a lot of uh, leading investigators in all sorts of fields, cardiology, basic science of cardiology, uh, basic science in oncology, basic science in neurology have identified lysosomal failure uh, meaning an inadequacy of the ability of lysosomes to degrade these pathological proteins, regardless of what disease a person particularly has, meaning that there's an overlapping mechanism of a reduced ability for our bodies to break down these pathological proteins. Need motivation? Watch a Top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. learn from the wise women and men. If you wear glasses or contacts, you must see this. An award-winning doctor reveals a Top 10. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Dr. Jay Lombard, and my take on his top 10 rules for success. Enjoy. Rule number two, understand the stressors. Stress is as physiological uh, regarding its effects on our bodies as any clinical condition. And even though we don't recognize it as being a disease per se, it increases our vulnerability for almost every major disease that we actually confront in practice. Whether we're talking about cardiovascular disease, immunological diseases, or even neurological diseases. So I think it's very important that we understand the basic pathophysiology of excessive stress and how that affects uh, our vulnerability for these different diseases. I think you need to look at it in a reciprocal way. It's not a, a cause and effect. Uh, they're both reciprocally interrelated, interdependent. I think that our perceptions of threat, um, whether real or perceived, is what initially triggers uh, the response of stress biologically, which includes activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and production of cortisol. Uh, from there, the normal reset button, the ability for us to essentially uh, readapt to that uh, experiential stress, uh, is often uh, inhibited or thwarted either by emotional or physiological factors. And I think the primary uh, function um, in a uh, physician's setting is to first recognize um, that when a patient is coming into their practice, to ask questions about what the stressors may be. You can't identify something if you don't know that it exists. So even um, doing a, a sleep evaluation, asking basic questions about sleep hygiene, will really tell a person, uh, a clinician, about the underlying vulnerability of stress, because that's when people mostly experience uh, the physiological effects of stress through you know, sleep disruption. Rule number three, ensure adequate perfusion. Is Alzheimer's an infectious disease? Uh, and other neurodegenerative diseases, Parkinson's. So I, I don't want to take credit for this theory. Uh, that's number one. Number two is I think that the way my thinking has evolved regarding this hypothesis is to try to explore how specifically uh, does any infection, 
produce neurological problems. So my, in, in regards to how my thinking is involved, uh, I think that these conditions are ultimately vascular based, uh, meaning that uh, inflammatory conditions, infectious diseases, uh, bad lifestyle, insulin resistance, hypertension, uh, all converge on the endothelium, on, on blood vessels, basically, in the walls of blood vessels. Uh, and that is sort of the underlying mechanism of neurological injury uh, that connects all these epigenetic factors to neurological diseases like ALS, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, in the old days back, uh, you know, in the 1990s when I finished my neurology residency, we would see on, on MRI studies when they first came out, because it was, you know, that in those days, MRI was just being introduced. Uh, we would see all sorts of, of changes, ischemic changes, changes like, like what we call mini strokes uh, or vascular changes uh, in various areas of the nervous system. So for instance, in Parkinson's disease patients, we would see you know, evidence of what's called small vessel ischemic disease. Uh, what does ischemic mean? He means lack of blood flow, interruption of blood flow. Um, and we still see these changes. If we do uh, MRIs on Alzheimer's patients or in patients with ALS, uh, we see what, what are called these unidentified bright objects, these UBOs, uh, that the radiologists uh, kind of comment on. And they, they say differential diagnosis could be vasculitis, it could be Lyme disease, uh, it could be just age-related white matter changes. But what, what all those things actually mean in principle is that whatever the provoking factor is, whether it's inflammatory mechanisms, uh, infectious mechanisms, uh, or some combination of, of various uh, interruptions, traumatic brain injuries, another example that can produce these vascular changes, uh, the, the smoking gun, if you will, uh, is really based upon disruption uh, in these very, very small blood vessels that are responsible to perfuse the brain because without perfusion of the brain, you could take any supplement you want. Uh, but if you don't have adequate perfusion, uh, you're not going to have a healthy brain. Rule number four, avoid infections. I recently had the uh, opportunity uh, to refocus my clinical practice primarily on ALS patients. Doctors can learn more from their patients than we can actually learn from them. And that's actually true. Uh, the first handful of patients that I had seen had complained of recurrent GI issues, uh, recurrent infections, uh, as well as exposure to mold, uh, which appeared to make their symptoms worse. Uh, at first, I kind of poo-pooed the idea. I didn't really think that uh, infections had anything to do with neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, but as I began to look at the research, I became more and more convinced uh, that in fact, infections are uh, a primary comorbid or driver of pathology in the nervous system, including ALS. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, go easy on antibiotics. You're saying there's one cause, which is C. diff for all neurodegenerative diseases? In order to prove that hypothesis, two things have to happen going forward. Two things. The first is we have to establish that there is C. diff uh, in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. Guess what? That study's been done. Yeah. Uh, it also showed that there was some... Yeah, poop for brains. Poop for brains. Is that, is that like is that a true website or something? Or is that, uh, uh, I thought Rudy uh, made that up. Uh, Poops no. for brains. Well, there's another way to say it, but... Uh, we, but, but more importantly, <laughs> clinically, clinically, I mean, look, people can say, oh, it's an epiphenomena, right? Like the brain is, you know, already decomposing. Decomp of course, you can have the bacteria emerging when the person's dead. They are argument, right? Maybe it's not that clostridium is causing the disease, but it's just, it's there for the ride as it eats your brain up after you're dead. 
right? That's that's sort of the meaning. Count. Meaning they find an autopsy, but right. maybe it, it's, it's, it's like it's it, does, a, it doesn't mean that it was there when they were living. Yeah. Right. So fair enough. That what that means is that we have to demonstrate. So they ran for the hills as soon as a person died. Is that it? <laughs> I guess. I, I don't know. <laughs> so that's true. Probably unlikely. Right. Yeah. Unlikely. Exactly. Yeah. But but in fairness to that sort of uh, counter punch, what what the medical community would ask for going forward is especially clinically, like we make a decision that, that we think that this is definitely C. difficile in you know, a patient with a disease like Alzheimer's, right? To make that conclusion clinically, you have to have absolute 100% evidence that that bacteria is actually causing that disease. Mm. With some, with some you know, yeah. obviously not every disease is gonna you know, test positive. And not only are, is a challenge here that the majority of patients who test for C. difficile who have dementia, uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and what have you, have negative tests for C. diff. In their stool. In their stools, right. And so people that are sort of looking at this picture with me, if you will, are saying exactly that. Well, it can't be C. diff because we're testing C. diff in the stool and it's not there. I say, well, guess what? It went uptown, okay? It used to live downtown, but it likes uptown more. Why? Because A, we give them PPIs, which they love that that alkalinic environment. Acid uh, blockers. Acid blockers. Like uh, Pepsid. And, and, what, and what do we give them that they love most of all? Antibiotics. Mm. C. diff loves antibiotics. It's, it's actually an they antibiotic associated infection. Exactly. That's how I got it. it I is, took an antibiotic course. for my bad tooth and I ended up getting yep. C. diff. Yep. If you had a choice, would you rather pay $12 for this cheese grater on Amazon or pay less than $2 on That's, I mean, that, if that's not a word of warning to all the listeners, I don't know what is. Yes, exactly right. C, basically, it's called antibiotic associated C. diff. Rule number six, establish a personalized regimen. There's a, a, a growing interest and focus on personalized medicine uh, throughout the entire ecosystem of oncology, neurology, psychiatry, uh, and other fields of medicine in which each person or patient is an N of one, meaning that uh, it's more important to establish uh, a therapeutic regimen that is based upon the specific biology uh, of that patient's condition. Uh, I think that otherwise we get into this uh, cookie cutter uh, concept that one size fits all. Uh, we know it's not true in ALS. I think the, the, the idea of nutraceuticals uh, should be as studied uh, and as appreciated as much as any pharmacological agent. Uh, that means understanding the source of the material that one is using uh, and have a very specific targeted rationale for which supplements one is prescribing for patients with ALS. There's a concept that, uh, that I've been studying called the SORET effect, which means that key nutraceuticals are activated by light. So by taking uh, certain compounds in combination with light exposure, one can increase the potentiation uh, of these compounds, which are called flavonoids. Flavonoids are like curcumin, uh, green tea, uh, chlorophyll, uh, phycocyanines, which are from blue-green algae, uh, and even methyl B12 and iron. So the, the critical issue, I think, that, that all patients and their physicians need to recognize uh, are really the ABCs of medicine. We have to start with our basics. The first thing we learned in medical school uh, is airway, breathing, and circulation. Uh, and it was alarming to me to identify uh, that patients uh, with ALS are walking around with, with low oxygen saturation uh, and that uh, they're not understanding the vitality and the critical need uh, for oxygen therapy itself uh, in patients with ALS. So uh, one of the most critical elements uh, when I evaluate uh, a patient with ALS or any neurodegenerative disease for that matter is to understand the psychosocial uh, factors that either contribute to uh, going forward with improved health or to actually have the opposite effect uh, and actually uh, separate uh, ones from each other because of the severe stress uh, that this condition puts not only in patients, uh, but their families. Rule number seven, embrace fever. Do you have trouble actually mounting a fever? So that's, that's, a, that's a question that I was surprised by the answer 
that most, I mean, not most, but most, my patients basically have said, no, you know what? I've, I have noticed I really never get a fever. I'm like, oh, okay. So. Which is not necessarily a good thing. That's, that's right. It's not a good thing at all. Because the only thing that actually will treat spores, right, is, is heat. Heat. If you look at, if you look at. That's why we get a fever, right? That's Which why we is, get a fever. You get a fever because it's your body's mechanism for killing infection. It's, it's, it's you know, I, I make a joke with people. I say them all the time. I said, name one disease that, that humans have cured. Cured. Like, oh, you know, they, and they always mention infectious diseases because that's, that's, that is the truth. We've yeah. cured infectious disease. But the only thing that actually cures disease is our endogenous mechanisms. You know, fever actually, fever and sleep basically are the two endogenous mechanisms of holistic medicine. And right? endogenous means stuff that you do yourself, your so body does Your itself. body's doing it for you. Yeah. But you have to help the body do that. You can't be staying up late and taking PPIs to watch, you know, Seinfeld episodes. You Rule number eight, assess periodontal diseases. Today, I'm going to reveal two proteins that make your arthritis pain worse. If you have arthritis, everyone is sort of, you know, uh, kind of puts this gut brain problem uh, into things like SIBO uh, or dysbiosis or, you know, um, you know, hyperpermeability of the gut. But I think what people most forget is that the, the, the closest proximity uh, of infectious diseases to the blood brain barrier is in periodontal uh, diseases. And that's mm. been strongly associated with, with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it's, 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 you know, the, the, the oral cavity is directly uh, proximal to the sinuses uh, of the brain. So that anywhere where you're going to see a leaky mucosal barrier, it's in people that have periodontal disease because that's the, the first area of, of staging of the battle between uh, these various infectious diseases and the immune system. So what happens is that the immune system is activated, right? Uh, to try to break down these uh, pathogens. And by the way, I used to think, because I'm not a dentist, I used to think that you know periodontal disease is all bacterial. But in fact, uh, periodontal disease has association with candida, uh, fungal infections. Uh, it's, it's not just bacteria that, if, that causes periodontal disease. But the point is that, that they're so close to the blood-brain barrier that they have an easier ability to migrate into the brain and produce an inflammatory reaction in the brain than leaky gut does. So I think that, you know, one of the take home messages I would have for your listeners is that, yes, I, I think that leaky gut uh, is, is a very important aspect of, you know, a functional medicine approach to any condition. But I think the first and foremost point of assessment uh, would be assessing periodontal disease in those patients. Rule number nine, start from the basics. Look at the, the foundation, which is genetics. Um, look at genetic expression, which are inflammatory markers. Uh, look at the basics, which is insulin resistance and um, uh, C-reactive protein as an inflammatory marker. And stick to the basics, essentially. So we know uh, that, you know, for instance, vitamin D plays a key role in both the immune axis as well as the uh, CNS. Um, I think that we really want to build on, you know, going from a, a simple foundational approach, uh, which looks at, you know, basic supplementation to a more specific targeted approach based upon the unique genetic profile of patients that have uh, really a need for individualized medicine so that we're able to target those in a particular specific way. And one classic example of that is the APOE4 allele, risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. We really do know that treatment is different based upon the E4 allele, whether it's non-pharmaceutical or pharmaceutical. And I think that um, we're gonna get much better at really understanding the connection between these nutritional supplements, uh, whether they're adaptogens or neurotrophic factors or even basic dietary supplements, um, and understanding where they're applied in specific um, imbalances, whether it's in the immune system, the brain, or the cardiovascular system. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is observe a healthy diet. What's changing is that we're essentially um, activating uh, metabolic reserves um, in a heightened way over a prolonged period of time. It's like being in a state of 9-11 red 
terror alerts uh, for 20 years. That has a uh, depleting effect on the reservoirs of whether it's the uh, mitochondrial functionality at a cellular level or at a tissue level. We're literally losing uh, our ability to regenerate tissue because we're in a fight or flight state. So I think we can understand this uh, from a pharmaceutical and nutraceutical perspective by looking at mitochondrial augmentation, how various supplements, whether it's dietary supplements or herbs or both, how they increase mitochondrial function. I think lowering excessive inflammation at its root cause, knowing if it's triggered by uh, persistent infections, whether it's periodontal disease or dysbiosis, uh, increasing the uh, probiotics in a diet so that we have uh, a more healthy immune gut mucosal barrier, and also looking at adaptogens, which are, are really designed in, in a sense evolutionarily uh, to adapt to stress, just like the plants themselves have adapted to stress by releasing these heat shock proteins and these other MER-181 regulatory systems, uh, we can actually exploit those uh, for our own health by understanding what those pathways are and increasing the consumption of those dietarily. Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. When you watch a video and just get motivated, the science says you have a 35% chance of actually following through on your goals. That, that's not good enough. No, not for you, Believe Nation. We gotta do something. But when you write it down and you create a specific plan of action for the next week, that number jumps to 91% chance of you following through. And when you commit to somebody else, like leaving a comment on this video, it jumps to 95%. You need to follow through on your goals. So what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your specific plan of action for the next week? Put it down in the comments below so I can celebrate.